It is good indeed to be here with you, and it is good that you are here. Uh, I always appreciate you making an effort to be with us and to stay with us also. Uh, if there are those who put us online, we appreciate you as well. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, somebody preach a sermon and when they got through, you thought, well, that sermon just really didn't go together. It was sort of disjointed and I don't know. It didn't flow. It just, you know. Well, if you have or haven't, tonight when you leave, you'll probably say that about this person. Uh, and the reason is because I'm going to talk about at least four different things that are totally unrelated. Uh, but I gave them one central title to say, well, this is wrong. That was this morning, the sickly thing I went through the night. Anyway, I gave one simple title called Living uh, for the Lord. And these various things are going to fit together uh, in a way that maybe, hopefully, we, we can benefit from it. But they are not necessarily, each of the points of the lesson are not necessarily related. To each other. Uh, we'll take a lesson beginning from Matthew chapter 5, and there beginning in verse 14. Jesus says there, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp, put it under a peck measure, but on a lampstand it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, as we think about that, we need to be reminded of um, Jesus is the light of the world. And, and we think about that, and we read in several passages where Jesus came into the world as a light. And he came to show us the Father and the way. To eternal life. One of these passages is John chapter 8 and verse 12. Again, therefore, Jesus spoke with them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And then in John chapter 12, there beginning verse 44, Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me uh, does not believe. He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. And he be who beholds me, beholds the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world that everyone who believes in me may not remain, remain in darkness. And so Jesus said that he is the light of the world. And basically what he says is, if you see me, you see the Father also. And yet, if you go back to Matthew chapter 5 and you look at our text, there Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Now, I think what Jesus is saying there is that when we give off the light of Jesus in our lives, others will see Him and also see the Father in us. So just like Jesus said, you see me, you see the Father, He is saying to us now that if you are living for me and you're shining the light that I'm giving to you, then others will see you and they will see me, they will see the Father. And when we do that, then we live in a way so that God gets all the glory, and it's not for us. People will look at us and say, boy, what a wonderful guy he is. They look and say, that guy is serving God. He is a Christian. He's serving Jesus. You can see God. You can see Jesus in him. And Jesus condemned those, and especially the Pharisees, who lived in such a way as to bring honor to themselves. They wanted people to look at him and say, boy, look at this guy. He's really religious. And they wanted people to pat them on the back and talk about how wonderful they were. And so in Matthew chapter 6, there in verse 2, Jesus says, When therefore you give alms, do not sound the trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Jesus said, What you're doing is you're, you're saying, Okay, I'm going to help somebody, but I want everybody to know I did. And so I'm going to make sure I'm going to blow a trumpet. I'm going to let everybody know that I, this poor guy needs some help and I'm going to give him some money 
And, and so everybody will pat me on the back and say, boy, what a generous guy he is. How wonderful he is. What a good heart he has. And Jesus said, you're doing it to be seen of men. And then he said, truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. They want to be seen by men, they're seen by men, and that's all they're going to get out of it. He says, the Father doesn't like that, and doesn't appreciate that, and he's not going to reward you for it. Now if you drop on down just a little bit more to verse uh, 5, there he says, when you pray, it's the same, same thing that he's talking about. When you pray, you're not to be as the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues on street corners in order to be seen by me. In other words, when they pray, they want everybody to pat them on the back and say, boy, that was a beautiful prayer. Truly I say to you, they have the reward for them. They're going to get the praise of them, but that's all they're going to get. God's not going to need to listen to their prayer. We drop on down to verse 16. He says, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance, nor they may be seen fasting by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Same thing with you. They're doing it to be seen of men. That's all they're going to get out of it. God does not honor them for that. He does not recognize their service because they're doing it for the wrong motives. And so we are to let the light of Jesus shine in us and shine through us. We don't shine our own light. But rather we, we reflect the light of Jesus and our motive is to please God. And that must be our motive in everything that we do as we serve Him is that we please Him and honor Him and in the process of doing that we can lead others to Jesus. So Paul says in Colossians 3 and verse 17, Whatever you do in work or death, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks from Him to God the Father. Make sure that what you're doing is to the glory of God, that He gets the honor and He gets the praise. And yes, we are to be religious people. We are to serve Him. We are to pray. We are to help people. These, all of these things are good things. But we need to make sure that our motive is right. And our motive is that we honor God and that Jesus receives the honor and the glory from our lives and it's not what we do for ourselves. The next thing that I want us to look at is that we're saved by grace. We're saved by grace because of forgiveness that we receive in Jesus Christ. It is based on the love. In Ephesians chapter 2, there beginning in verse 4, he says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with him, or with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. And so we talk about grace and we talk about forgiveness based on love. And we see that as God extends His grace to us and His forgiveness through Jesus Christ, and it is based on His great love with which He loves us. But if God does that for us, then He wants us to do the same thing toward other people. We must be willing to love and be willing to forgive, extending grace to others. And that means we show them our love and we show them this forgiveness, not because they deserve it or not because they earn it, but the very idea of grace is that it is undeserved. 
So we show others this kind of grace because we have been forgiven, we have received grace, and we love because God loves. And so it's not because they deserve it or they earn it, but it's so that we can imitate God and imitate Jesus Christ in our life. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, after he's taught his disciples how to pray, he says, if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. If we're not willing to forgive other people, then we don't need to expect God to forgive us. And this is just one of many passages that talk about this same thing in Colossians 3. There beginning in verse 12, he says, uh, As those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect God of you. And so as we think about this, this grace and this forgiveness based on love, we must be willing to forgive others and show them our love and extending grace to them, even though they don't deserve it, even though they haven't done anything to earn it, but so that we can imitate God. And this includes our attitude toward those with whom we disagree. And it doesn't matter if it's just some fiddly matter that we've gotten into a discussion with somebody or it may be some political thing or it may be religious. It doesn't make any difference what it is. The fact is we need to be willing to extend our grace to them even when we disagree with them. But this is especially true in religion. It is especially true, true when I think that the Bible teaches this way and another person thinks the Bible teaches this way and the two don't agree. In Romans chapter 14, there beginning in verse 1, Paul says, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. And because the word opinion is used here, it has traditionally been taught in the commentaries and the, the teaching that most people have done among the churches of Christ that Romans 14 is just talking about matters of opinion. It has nothing to do with what people think is right and wrong. It just if it's matters strictly of opinion, and that's all it is. Well, that's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about here your conviction, your belief, your opinion is you think this somebody else's opinion is something else. But it's not just frivolous things. It's things that matter. One man has faith that he may eat all things, but one who is weak eats vegetables only. And so one guy says he has faith, and he says, I believe I need anything. Another man, his faith says, no, I can't do that. Let not him who eats regard with contempt him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has accepted him. So here you have this difference in understanding that one is saying, we can eat these things. And the other says, no, we can't eat these things. And one of them says, well, God says we can. The other says, no, God says we can't. And they don't agree. And he says, the fact is, you don't judge that person. You don't look at them with contempt. But rather, you extend to them grace and you extend to them uh, a willingness to be able to forgive and to love them. Who are you to judge the servant of another? His own mastery stands or falls and standing will for the Lord is able to make him stand. I want you to think about that. If I am in a standing relationship with God, it is only because He loves me enough that by His grace He has forgiven me. And if God can do that for me, He can do it for this person that I don't agree with. And that means that person is just as much in standing with God as I am. So we need to be careful in, in the way we look at others that we disagree with. One man 
man regards one day above another, another man regards every day alike. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. He's talking here about observing religious holidays. He says, he who observes the day observes it for the Lord. Here's a man that believes that he must keep this religious holiday and he's doing it for the Lord and he's conscientious in doing it. He who eats does so for the Lord. He thinks he's got to eat these foods and he does it for the Lord. And he gives thanks to God. He who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. The other person thinks he can't, he doesn't, and he gives thanks to God the same thing. For not one of us lives for himself. Not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be both Lord, but the Lord both of the dead and the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or why, again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God, so that each one of us shall give an account to himself. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. We need to make sure that everything we do is based on our love for God and our love for others, and do what we can to encourage everyone to be faithful to God, even when we disagree with We need to remember that our understanding is not the standard of truth. God's Word is the truth. Jesus is the truth. It's not me, it's not my understanding. That's the end of that lesson. Now let's go to the next one. Being parents is an awesome responsibility. We're to raise our children to know and love and serve the Lord, and that means that we need to discipline, we need to train, we need to teach. We're all familiar with Ephesians 6, there verses 1 through 4, he talks about children, the way your parents are in the Lord, and honor your father and mother, and so on. He says, fathers, in verse 4, do not provoke your children in anger, but bring them up in the teaching and the admonition of the Lord, or the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Passage that some of us are familiar with and some may not be so familiar with is in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 22 where he says, He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. And it is necessary for parents to discipline their children. And we need to understand that. And sometimes it may mean that they need a weapon. Uh, it may mean that they need to sit in the corner. It may mean they need talking to it may mean any number of things, but I'm going to tell you something about children. From the time they are about, oh, probably three days old, they become master manipulators of parents. And they realize real quickly what they can get away with and what they can't. And they will use every ploy they can to get their way Every time they can. And, and you can see it in many, many different ways. And, and, and as parents, we need to be aware of that. And we need to not let them manipulate us and let them know that we are in charge, not them. And they are going to do what we tell them to do, not what they want to do just because they want to do it. And, and it may mean that, you know, sometimes they do need a woman. It may mean that other things. Whatever the case may be. But we need to make sure that we discipline our children and bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But this is not license to abuse them. And there are some people that think if you discipline them, then anyway, then you can abuse them. That's not true. The Bible teaches that we are to discipline them. It even tells us that there are times that it's appropriate to spank them. But the fact is, that is not a license to abuse children. And we have seen, in fact, just this past week, I don't know that I've ever seen Diane as upset about the behavior of somebody else as she was. We were at a religious gathering. And there was a woman there who had a little girl that was probably five years old or something like that. And I didn't see the little girl do anything. I didn't see the little girl do anything. But whatever it was she did, she 
must have bit somebody's leg off or something. That mother grabbed that little girl and I, how she kept her sock in her shoulder, I don't know. She grabbed her and yanked her up and I don't think literally yanked her up and drugged her out of that auditorium. She came back in a while later and sat her down and Keep in mind, this little girl's probably six years old, and this lesson went on for over an hour. And for about an hour, she made that little girl write sentences. Diane was actually watching this time the little girl and still didn't see anything. And the mother leaned over and said something to the little girl, and the little girl literally started shaking because of fear. And then the mother jerked her up again and took her. That's child abuse. And if I had known who they were, I would have turned her in. I, I don't know who. But if I had, I would have turned her in. Because that's child abuse. And I'm going to tell you, when, when the child's misbehaving in church, I, we got a place back there, we got outdoors, take them out there and give them a good way. And if you take them out and they come back in and do the same thing all over again, you probably didn't make it uncomfortable enough for them when you took them out. And if you take them to the cry room and let them play, then you're just encouraging them to get go that back there and play. But if they misbehave and you take them out and make it uncomfortable enough for them, they won't want to go back out another time. I can assure you when I was a kid, the last thing I wanted was for my mother to take me out of church. That wasn't good. And so we need to make sure. But it's not a license to abuse them. What we need to do is find the in-between of, of abuse and lack of discipline. And somewhere in there, train them to do what's right. And in the process, teach them respect for authority. Your authority as parents, authority of God, first and foremost, authority of the civil government and authority of others that are in positions of authority. That's all on that one. We'll move on to another. Life is short. James 4, 13, he says you're just a paper that appears for a little while and it's gone. Thursday night, the truth lectures were at the Bible school. Thursday morning, there was a man who spoke named Sean Cavender. He's 36 years old. That night, as he was leaving, his car went out in front of the truck, and he was killed instantly, leaving a wife and two small children. His wife and kids were in Kansas, where he was from. He was just 36. Two weeks ago, he preached a sermon, and he ended his sermon by saying, You better live every day as though it's your last because you don't know it. I'm going to tell you something. When I was 36 years old, I preached about life is short, and I preached about we don't know how long we're going to live and all that kind of stuff. But you know, I never applied it to myself. I mean, I was 36 years old. I had plenty of life left. I was talking to these old people. I went to hold them there. But you see, life is short. And it doesn't matter if you're 16 or 18 or 22 or 32. I don't mean to embarrass anybody, but Jacob Lovell's girlfriend Abby was in a wreck yesterday morning. She's okay. She banged up. And she's okay. Her car was stolen. But it could have just as easily, looking at the car, it could have just as easily been that she had been hurt really bad or maybe even killed. And she's a young girl. You see, we don't know whether what age we are that if this will be. The last time we lived. Life is short and there's not any promise more than this one. And the fact is, it may be tonight, it may be tomorrow, it may be next year, it may be a hundred years from now, but you will die and you will face God in judgment. The question is, are you saved? Have you seen it? You fit one of those two categories. Everybody does. And so tonight, if, if you're not saved, if you're not a child of God, you can be saved tonight by giving Jesus your heart and your life and confessing your faith in Him, turning away from your sin and being buried in baptism. If you're here and you
being subject to his invitation. We invite you to come to this. Okay. Okay.